Welcome to uh, the Pacific Northwest chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. Uh, our symposium theme is Crystal Habits, uh, the Good and the Bad. And we have our next speaker is Aaron Delventhal, surprise, surprise, talking about pseudomorphs. <laughs> so um, Aaron, uh, like many of our speakers uh, th this weekend, uh, started uh, at a young age. Her family took her on road trips and they would always take side trips uh, to go collecting and so that's always been a passion of hers. Uh, and then uh, she's also been uh, enthusiastic about art, photography and design uh, and uh, went to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show one year and just that really reignited her love for minerals and she started uh, getting back into it in a very serious way as we've seen uh, in recent years. So. Um, she lives in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, with her cats Cricket and Mouse, uh, and yay, for, yay furry friends. Um, she also uh, helps out on the side with uh, Enchanted Minerals, LLC, so you'll see her at uh, Denver and Tucson, a number of other shows. So, um, and she's also uh, an online sales manager uh, uh, for a company that does design and photography work. So. Uh, here is Erin Delventhal to uh, present about pseudomorphs, the story of a habit. Good morning. Hope everybody's awake. Um, super excited to be here. The talks yesterday were absolutely fabulous. Um, today I'm going to talk a lot about the things that I don't know, and I feel like that's going well with everything that we saw yesterday because there's a lot of questions that we haven't answered, and that's the fun part. Um, so I learned a lot putting the talk together, but mostly what I learned is that I don't know anything about anything. Uh, and it's great. It's great. That's the way science is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a process of discovery. And I love this community because we are all collaborating to learn more. And I learned so much from all of you. And it's, it's amazing. I love you guys. So today I want to share with you about all of the pieces of information that can be revealed by the crystal habits that are preserved by pseudomorphism. Um, I am an amateur. If I say anything that's absolutely ridiculous, please email me and correct me <laughs> because I would love to know the right answer instead of operating on an error. And so we'll get going. So we're going to do just a quick section of definitions. Um, a habit is the description of the external shape that a crystal or crystal aggregate displays. So this could be describing crystallographic forms like cubic or octahedral, or the relationship between multiple crystals like drusy or fibrous. Um, note the bold section of this last definition. We're going to see if I know how to do this. Perfect. This little section here uh, represents the result of the atomic structure of a mineral with the environment in which it grows. So there's a lot of different things that can impact how a crystal habit develops. Um, I don't think this list is complete. There are probably a lot of other factors. Um, note that items number seven and eight, degree of supercooling and mode of convection, um, those are from a, a paper about ice crystals. So we're dealing in that case with deposition from a vapor, which I loved that that came up yesterday because we're gonna talk a little bit about that too. It's important to remember that gases can play a role in what we're doing and I think we tend to overlook that. Now, defining a pseudomorph. Um, we could talk all day about this. We're not going to because I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> okay. um, this is the definition that we're gonna run with today. If you don't like it, that's okay. You can email me. I might not respond to that email. So, <laughs> a pseudomorph is a mineral or mineral aggregate that exhibits the shape of a different pre-existing solid material. Um, I think that fits in pretty well with Hui's original definition. If you don't like it, we can talk about it, but we're not going to do that today. So there are several different mechanisms of pseudomorphism. So there's a lot of debate here. We're going to be pretty inclusive today. Um, See, there's my I lost. There we go. Hang on, sorry guys, I lost my, my mouse. So alteration is probably the um, mechanism that most people think of when you talk about pseudomorphs. This is going to be your malachite after azurite. This is a chemical reaction that's happening where you're gaining, losing, or exchanging elements between two species. 
Paramorphism is a case where two minerals of identical chemistry but different crystal structure can realign internally when um, conditions become unstable. So a great example of this is your acanthite after argentite. Um, incrustations, broadly lumps in things that are usually your paramorphs and your epimorphs, we're going to put them all together, they're incrustations. And that's just exactly what it sounds like, something got encrusted. Uh, casts and molds are related to void spaces. So a mold is a, a negative space created by the dissolution of a mineral preserved in something like a clay. A cast is then what happens if that void space is filled in by another mineral. So those two kind of go together. Um, infiltration is a category that I honestly find very confusing. Um, it's somewhat like casts and molds, except that it's happening simultaneously. Uh, dissolution of one mineral is happening while a second mineral is precipitating all at the same time. Um, this is usually the explanation that's given for oddball pseudomorphs, that there doesn't seem to be any chemical connection. I'm not entirely sure that that's the way we should be looking at things, but there are, there are examples and we'll see some where this is kind of the only thing that makes sense. Um, metamictization and exsolution, we're not really going to talk about those today but we should make a note that those do exist. So metamictization is a process by which radiation is going to break apart your internal structure. You're technically ending up with an amorphous material. There's a solid argument that's a pseudomorph. Um, exsolution is going to be a case where you have a mixture that crystallizes and then separates out in a solid solution series into different species after it was crystallized, basically. But again, we're not really going to talk about those. It's hard to find examples of a few of those. So the story. Um, pseudomorphs tell us a geologic story through the preservation of a habit. So you start with the conditions that created your original mineral, your original habit. Um, then something or multiple somethings happened, and you have a change. This gives us a change over time. Um, the original material is affected by whatever mechanism of replacement, resulting in a new mineral resembling the shape of the original, but also containing its own clues because that mineral is going to have a habit too. So let's look at some stories. So I'm going to start with glendonites because we can't not talk about glendonites. Um, there is actually a mineralogical story here, but today on this one, I'm going to talk about the human story, and that's the story of studying glendonites. So it's good to remember that we as observers are an active part of science developing. So when we talk about how these things, our ideas about them have changed over time, we are part of this story. And I think it's good to remember that we are not outside of what's happening. We are participating in our observations and in our studies. So we're part of these stories. So glendonites are probably best known from the uh, work of James Dwight Dana, who described specimens from Glendon, Australia as prismatic shapes up to 20 inches long with a slight curve in opposite directions and tapering towards each end. Note that the description of the texture is granular, which is funny because he doesn't outright state that these are pseudomorphs, but all the signs are there. So 50 years later, the name glendonite was given to these specimens but it wasn't the only name. Discoveries of other occurrences at other localities resulted in a list. So there's the German Gersten Corner, the Russian White Sea Hornlets, the Alaskan Coolcoots, the English Jarawites, the Canadian Fundalites, and the Japanese uh, Geno, Geno Ishii. All the same, but of course nobody knew that yet. So in 1884, the Dana-Glendonite legacy continued when his son, Edward Salisbury Dana, published a crystallographic study of the thinolite of Lake Lahontan, describing the specimens found in northern Nevada and just across the border in California. Since the specimens were found on the shores of the lake, they were named thinolite, which is a name uh, derived from the Greek word for, sh for shore. Um, so there's a bunch of illustrations in this text. They're absolutely beautiful. But one of the interesting things is figures 34 through 37, which actually depict uh, pseudomorphs from other localities, including duplications of uh, J.D. Dana's illustrations from Glendon, as well as some examples from Astoria, Oregon. You, you guys have some glendonites up here. So the problem with glendonites was that while it was very clear that these were pseudomorphs of some sort, there was definitely some recognition that there was a connection between some of these different localities. Nobody could figure out what the precursor was. So for 150 years, there was debate, was it galacite, globarite, thenardite, anhydrite, gypsum, something else entirely? 
150 years that they're arguing about this. Then in 1963, Hans Pauli described the mineral icaite. So icaite's a weird mineral. Um, it forms at near uh, freezing temperatures in water with high alkalinity and orthophosphate concentration. Uh, it's unstable at higher temperatures and will disintegrate into a powder, which explains why it took us so long to find it and study it. Um, the funny thing is, though, that it had actually been synthesized in a lab for almost the entire 150 years that we were arguing about it, but nobody had found a natural occurrence. So luckily, to overcome the delicate nature of igite, we have the pseudomorphs to study instead. Um, because of the very precise conditions theorized for igite formation, glendonites have been used as a paleoclimatic indicator. Um, an occurrence of glendonites means that the conditions were right for igite, which means it was cold. And this becomes a critical data point when studying periods of paleoclimatic cooling. Now, some recent research has actually raised questions around this use of glendonite, uh, namely that there might be more variation to the possible temperature ranges when um, these are forming. Um, but that's how science works. We find new information and we revise and we adapt. Um, and I think given that it took us 150 years to figure out what mineral it is, it's okay that this story isn't over yet. We're still, we're still working on it and that's good. So with glendonites, of course, about as colorful as you get is the uh, Olenitsa River specimens. Unless, of course, you get replaced again. And so the opal pineapples from Australia are suspected to be opal replacements of calcite after icaite. I think the form probably is icaite. I'm not convinced that the opal replaced the calcite. It's very possible that it's opal after icaite and that calcite middle step isn't there. I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to keep the story pretty short today on glendonites because the latest issue of Rocks and Minerals magazine has a fantastic article from George Kennedy on the subject that's going to give you far more detail than I can cover today. Um, Marie and Julian were kind enough to get a bunch of those issues here today, so if you don't have a subscription and you need a copy, let us know. I think Marie said $12. You can have a copy. So the next thing. If you were worried that I was going to talk about crusty beige minerals all day, I, I need you guys to know I was really tempted. <laughs> I, I was, but I'm not going to torture you. We can find some interesting things with some color to talk about, so we'll talk about some copper pseudomorphs. So, of course, the first thing that anybody thinks of when you think of a pseudomorph is malachite after azurite. So we're going to do a little bit of science first. So this is a pHCO2 fugacity phase diagram. This plots the stability of these species in relationship to the pH, which is running vertically, which basically is indicating the availability of the reactive hydrogen. Uh, CO2 fugacity, which is running horizontally on this diagram, um, indicates the availability of uh, reactive CO2. Um, and then this graph and some of the other graphs we're going to look at in a second were posted by Dr. Salvin in a discussion regarding um, pseudomorph chemistry on the Friends of Minerals forum, which I strongly recommend checking out. There's some fantastic discussion there. So what this tells us is that at moderate CO2 pressure, malachite is more stable than azurite. Now what this means is that azurites that are kept in your collection are all slowly altering, all of them, every single one, <laughs> just so you know. Keep an eye on your azurites because in 30 years, you, you, they might start to get a little green. Um, and then a part of the discussion on the FMF forum, which I found absolutely fascinating, is you know, we have this story about malachite pigments and azurite pigments used in historical painting, art preservation problems, and how azurite pigments with time would alter to malachite. Um, this is why. So this is partially why we want to remember that that vapors are involved in things because we didn't put the paintings underwater. Those, that's a reaction that's happening in the air. And there's a certain amount of moisture in the air, certainly, but that's also as a gas. Humidity is, is a gas. So it's important to remember these things are going to happen very slowly as a gas just because all of your little particles are so much further spread apart. When you're in a liquid, everything is denser, you have more reactive particles, you're going to have quicker reactions. But don't forget that gases do things. So we're going to um, take a look now at a sort of third axis. So we're still looking at the uh, pH, uh, 
CO2 fugacity diagram, but we're going to look at this changing from um, reducing conditions to oxidizing conditions. So when we start with these uh, uh, slightly reducing conditions, as we move to oxidizing conditions, you can see how these phases shift. And you can see the areas of sulfides and native metals are shrinking while the areas of oxides and carbonite, carbonates are expanding. And then here we reach normal atmosphere. So we're going to do this again. We're going to go backwards this time because it's important to remember that these things do go backwards and forwards. It's not a one-way progression. Um, systems fluctuate. And we're going to put a little point here so that we can kind of get a better idea of what this means in practice. So we're looking at, you know, this little orange dot that we've got, uh, slightly acidic conditions, moderate CO2 pressure at normal Earth atmosphere that puts us in the azurite phase. So we're going to go backwards. So slight shift towards reducing conditions, we're still in azurite. Now we're starting to cross some lines though. So we're at a junction between azurite, cuprite, and nantokite, which is a copper chloride. Now we're into native copper. And now we're into chalcosite. So again, as we move towards reducing conditions, we haven't changed the pH, we haven't changed the CO2 availability, everything stayed the same, but by changing one of these other factors, you get wildly different results. And largely what I want to get out of this with this talk today is that you have all of these multitude of factors. Any one of those shifting in any direction is going to give you some very different results. So it's very complicated. This is kind of a, a reduction of that. Um, but there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of things going on. And, and any change in any one of those is going to have an effect. So the results end up being pretty fascinating. Um, we've got a nice partial replacement here, unaltered blue azurite, but the malachite started to replace. Um, the replacement in this case is showing preferential development. Uh, it's not uniform across all of the surfaces, it's patchy. So it seems to be preferential to either the edges of the crystals or one of the adjacent faces. Either way, it's crystallographically controlled. So there's a connection between the alteration process and the habit of the original azurite. So the other thing to take note of, and we're going to talk about this a lot today, is texture. Uh, malachite is taking some of its own characteristics. So the little radiating fibrous textures that we see there, that's not the azurite, that's the malachite. So even though it's taking on this form of a precursor mineral, we're getting information from two different habits, the original azurite and the replacing mineral. So we'll see that again and again. Almost all pseudomorphs are going to start to see some funny textures. Um, there's a reason for this, of course. Um, various textures can indicate various things. With pseudomorphs, in particular alteration pseudomorphs, um, one dominant cause of these textures is going to be differences in volume. So azurite has a volume of 91 cubic centimeters per mole, whereas malachite has 55. Malachite is denser than azurite, same amount of matter condensed into a smaller volume. In the case of alteration pseudomorphs, these chemical reactions inherently have to produce some degree of porosity. The malachite cannot fill in the structure completely because it, it's smaller. It, there has to be void space. Um, the only exception to that would have to be something that's two minerals with the same density, and I don't know that that's probably very common. I can't say that it never happens, but most things there's going to be a little bit of a difference. You're going to have some amount of either contraction or expansion. Um, so then another thing we're going to look at with this is kind of this funny little droplet area. And we see that again when we look kind of towards the bottom of the specimen. We see these circles. Um, I would describe them as like they're drops of water. I don't really know what causes this. It's possible that it is just drops of water. You know, as we talked about, water is going to result in, in more available um, molecules and ions to create a reaction. So if you have water droplets on the surface of something, you're going to have quicker reactions in that area. That might be what's going on. I don't know. 
Now the other thing is when we look at the bottom of this, we have something else interesting. Those, it's, those are fully developed crystals of malachite. So if we have a chemical alteration by which m one mineral is gaining, losing, or exchanging elements that result in a different mineral, where's the open space for crystals to develop? You know, we have this idea that everything has to be, have open space for crystals to develop, but this seems to run a little bit contrary to that. Um, God, I lost my list again. So this ties into another interesting uh, point raised in the FMF discussion, again, about volume. The difference in the volume of malachite is enough that um, for malachite to take the form of azurite, the internal crystal structure of the azurite is actually destroyed. Hypothetically or theoretically, because of this, you can go from azurite to malachite. You shouldn't be able to go from malachite back to azurite. And that raises some interesting questions because we see many specimens that are labeled as azurite after malachite after azurite where you go back. I would love to look at more of these, but I, it's not supposed to be able to do that. Whether that's just a later stage of growth of azurite is what's causing that is very likely, but I need to do some more explanation of that. Um, so pseudomorphs are often more complicated than we record on our labels. Uh, if we were going to be very precise about things, we would end up with very long labels because you're really looking at sequences of alterations in many of these. Um, so if we look, for example, at the specimen on the left, the tenantite after malachite after azurite, um, sometimes we have this term uh, double pseudomorphs, and there's an argument over what exactly a double pseudomorph is. Um, technically, this is one form. It's just the azurite, and that form has been stolen twice. So whether that's what a double pseudomorph is, we'll see there's some other usages of that term. Um, it certainly is easier to count um, the number of shapes versus the number of stages because we don't always see all of the stages. So moving on to some other notable copper mineral pseudomorphs, we've got cuprite. Um, cuprite as an oxide of copper will oxidize further to malachite. And chessy, of course, is the classic example of that replacement. Uh, like what we saw with the azurite replacements, we have a very distinct texture that starts to appear in some of the malachites. So these fibrous surface textures, that's not the cuprite, that's the malachite. Um, we also see kind of some weird pockmarked textures where we can see the cuprite underneath. Um, I'm not sure exactly whether there was a material there that, that blocked the malachite um, and that's dissolved. Um, not entirely sure what's going on there. I don't know also whether there's ever been any study of the density of the chessy material. Um, in this case, the malachite is obviously a very thin coating. I don't know if there are other specimens that are replaced throughout. One of the things that we need to remember is that a lot of what's going on with uh, pseudomorphs has to do with surface area. And there are replacements where once the alteration has happened on the surface, it's actually blocking any more interaction deeper into the material. So you'll end up with surface replacements where it can't get in to alter the material all the way through. Um, so we see probably a little bit of that here that's pretty common in the Blanchard Galenus um, that will alter on the surface and it just can't really get any deeper. So in this example, the surface is a little bit different. Um, we start to see the texture of fibrous malachite, but it's more compacted. There's a darker color caused by some kind of blackish mineral. Based on what we were looking at with our phase diagrams, we could guess that that's maybe tenorite, but that would be a guess. Um, and if we turn this around, we see something else kind of fun. So we have some defined malachite crystals, but look at where they're positioned. So again, we start to see something where there's a crystallographic control to where this is developing. Those are positioned on the edges of a face. Um, when we look at the theories of crystal growth, we find that edges and corners tend to have a stronger atomic attraction. So it's very possible that that's what's happening is it's, it's a physical attraction. It could be something else too. I don't think it's random though. 
And so if we look at the same replacements of cuprite but a different locality, uh, we start to see a lot of the same factors. So this example has intense pitting. The malachite is not fibrous this time, but botryoidal. There's whole crystalline cavities inside this replacement. Um, so there's one other little conversation to be had about volume. There's a definition of pseudomorph that stipulates that the replacing mineral occupies the same volume as the original material. Now, I think that that definition comes from a desire to push incrustations out of the realm of pseudomorphs, which I personally don't agree with, but that's okay, that's a conversation. What we have to be a little bit careful with in doing that is when we are looking at these alteration pseudomorphs, they're not occupying the volume. If you want them to occupy the same volume, they're porous. So I think we need to be a little bit careful taking that definition because if we're trying to throw out incrustations, we're also throwing out all of the malachite alterations, and I don't think that's what anybody wanted. <laughs> um, so and that's not to say that you know a different mechanism of replacement couldn't satisfy this definition, but with alteration pseudomorphs, because of the way that they are interchanging chemically, you're almost guaranteed to have some porosity. So just to finish up with cuprites, uh, we can look at a reversal in the trend towards oxidation. The copper replacements of cuprite are moving from the oxide cuprite to the base metal copper, so this is actually a reduction. The texture is fully formed cryst uh, copper crystals that take up a broader shape of cuprite. And I actually really enjoy this specimen because you have these really nicely defined octahedrons, but then there's just this one crystal hanging out down here that's got cubic modifications. It's the only one on the whole, whole specimen, but that one does. And I think it's interesting to look at when you're talking about these different factors that are influencing how a habit develops, there can be changes not just between pockets, it can be in the same pocket, it can be an inch away that you have different conditions resulting in something else. Um, so we'll stick with copper, but we'll look at copper mineral replacements of non-copper minerals. Uh, Coro Coro, I think, offers a really readily accessible example of this. And so these specimens are replacements of aragonite trillings. These are three individual penetration twinned crystals. And so these can be single crystals or radial aggregates. Uh, the growth varies from very sharp, well-formed crystals to increasing degrees of what's usually called skeletal growth. Um, and now that we've moved away from copper moving through different phase stabilities, we're, we're outside of alteration pseudos. We don't have that chemical con um, commonality it's aragonite and copper, there's no relationship there. Um, so now we're looking at some kind of other replacement mechanism. Um, so this is probably something, it's a void space being filled, whether that's as a cast and mold where there's an entire void space that is later infilled or whether we have a case of this infiltration concept where it's dissolving and replacing at the same time, I'm not entirely sure. Um, in some cases, the skeletal growth can appear very extreme. Um, so in this example, I think there's more hollow space than there is copper, yet the form of the aragonite is still discernible. Um, I'm not convinced that all of these are a case of skeletal growth. It's possible, but there are some other possibilities. Um, the first thing I think to remember is that if you have skeletal growth, that means that you must also have the ability to have a process that is skeletal dissolution. So whether it's a process of it grew like that or whether it's a process of it is dissolving to come to that shape, either of those is possible. Um, another thing to remember is that um, most pseudomorphs are not complete replacements. So there's any degree from zero to 100% is possible. That's technically 99 stages of partial replacement to one stage of total replacement. And I think just by statistics, most things are not going to be completely replaced. So if we go back and kind of look at what we were looking at with these less skeletal ones, there does seem to be some degree of uh, skeletal crystallization. Um, again, whether that's part of growth or whether that's part of dissolution, I think we still have a lot of questions to answer there. Um, it's good to remember that pseudomorphs are deceptive and we need to be careful with our assumptions. 
So if we look at kind of some examples of these moving from different stages of oxida oxidation, um, we can lead with this guy. That's about as coppery as you can get. Um, there's actually even a little uh, little leaf over here on the side that that's not even part of the aragonite structure. It's just got a little copper arm hanging off. And so then things start to get a little bit muddier. Um, so certainly still a copper pseudomorph, but a little bit more complicated. Um, there seems to be some aragonite remaining. You can kind of see there's a corner here where we can see into the inside. You can also see along these vertices, that's still aragonite. Whether that's something that the copper's been removed, whether it was never deposited to begin with, I couldn't tell you. Um, there's definitely some variety to the mineralization, so we have some signs of green and blue that are indicating some oxidization. Um, the reverse shows us another layer, which is really perplexing to me. Uh, that's cuprite. But what's interesting is the idea around pseudomorphs is that they are replacing from the outside in. If we're following our phase diagrams, you should have copper that's replacing in and then cuprite that's replacing in. I don't know why the cuprite's underneath the copper, it's backwards. Uh, I'm sure that there's a reason. I don't know what the answer is. And so we have a core again that's still aragonite. So something interesting is happening. Um, we can also see how the oxidation advances when we look at a sample that has more cuprite replacement. Again, we have a really good blend of different minerals. There's a few things happening here. And on the reverse, we see very strong cuprite. Um, and the texture, again, is just wild. I mean, that's got enough void space to be a sponge. Um, there's some signs, I think, of crystallized cuprite. I don't quite have enough magnification on my camera set up right now to get in there that good, but I think down in this edge, there looked like there were some crystal faces. Um, so when we talked about porosity before, we were talking about alteration pseudomorphs where void space is caused by differences in volumes. Um, in this case, we're looking at after aragonite. Technically, probably what's happening with this is that we're still in an alteration pseudomorph when we're moving from copper to cuprite. That has a common chemistry, even though the aragonite doesn't. That's probably what's causing this. Um, But the other thing I think we have to look at, um, especially in terms of the idea of an infiltration pseudomorph, is it's, I would assume, possible that w the rate of dissolution and the rate of precipitation in that process might not be happening in equal volumes. If something is dissolving slightly faster than the next mineral is precipitating, you're going to end up with some weird pore spaces because of that. And I think it's an interesting, this is kind of where I get stuck on this one, and I'm, I hope somebody's going to send me an email and explain this to me, because I, I don't understand it. What the difference is between cast and mold and infiltration, the, the main idea seems to be it's a factor of time. When you're dealing with cast and mold, you have a completely open space that is then filled in, whereas by infiltration, it's dissolving and precipitating at the same time. You're still dealing with void space, but it's a timing factor. I don't know what our requirements are for how fast that infiltration has to happen. We say simultaneous, but, but what does that mean? Is that seconds, milliseconds? You know, where do you draw that line if you're trying to separate these two categories out? So as we saw with the cuprite earlier, the next stage of oxidation, we move to malachite. Um, coppers replace some part of the aragonite. Copper's oxidized to cuprite, which then oxidizes further to malachite. And my understanding with the uh, um, malachite is that there has to be a cuprite stage for this to happen. That's just the natural progression of things. Whether we see that cuprite every time or not is questionable, but for copper to go to malachite, there has to be a cuprite stage. Um, the copper also displays some really interesting like dendrites up on these vertices. And I couldn't really tell whether this was something that was growing out or growing in, but something interesting happening there. And so some of the features that we're looking at today, I have to tell you guys, I didn't notice half of these things until I started putting this talk together. And I don't know if, if with age, my eyesight is just getting worse or if I'm not spending as much time studying these as I would like to, but there were a lot of things like out of my own collection, I've never noticed that before. Um, and this is one of those because we flip this over and we see we've got a great partial pseudomorph. 
um, considerable portion of aragonite remaining. The copper to cuprite to malachite relationship is happening on the exterior. But what is that? You know, if we're talking about these pseudomorphs happening from the outside in, that, that sure looks like copper. That sure looks like it's internal. It kind of has some tree ring shapes going on. I, I have no idea, but that doesn't match with the idea of things moving from the outside in. And so we see that feature again on the sides here. We've got rings. So the interesting thing here, I think, is that these are oriented to the crystal structure of the aragonite. They're not random, they're, they're crystallographically oriented. So what's happening here, whether it's a function of um, a chemical zoning in the aragonite, whether it's a structural thing that's got a layer that is easier to replace, it could be something else that I haven't thought of, but something interesting is happening. So from what I understand of the coral coral specimens, the most oxidized state is going to be a full malachite replacement. And we've got some great porosity happening here. Um, again, we've got the porosity probably just in the sequence of um, volume changes. We won't ask too many questions about that one. And then we see the side, which has kind of got a slight hollow. It's not quite as skeletal as some of them, but there's a depression there. But that's kind of weird because I don't know if you can see this very well, but we have those rings again. And in this case, um, when we're looking over here, we're not actually looking at this brown material so much. Uh, it's looking at it in, in person, it's kind of a dull earthy material. I don't think that's a native copper, it's something else. But if we're looking at the way that this has changed to malachite, we're not concerned with the copper, we're concerned with those green rings. And I hope that you guys can see that okay, because we have that same circular texture that we're seeing in this other one. So these are just specimens out of my own collection. I found two of them, which says to me that there probably is some more of this out there because that's odd, odd coincidences. I don't know what's happening, but it's interesting. So now that we've looked at coral coral, we're actually going to detour a second and still looking at aragonite pseudomorphs, but we're going to move over to New Mexico to look at cottonwood draw, which has dolomite replacements of aragonite. Same habit, pseudohexagonal aragonite, similar depositional environment of the aragonite. And we've got a lot of porosity again. Um, this was another one that was a little bit of a surprise to me because I'd kind of, I've been out here, I've collected here, I've always assumed that the dolomite was kind of just poorly formed, granular, maybe slightly decomposing. No, it turns out those are dolomite crystals. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, they're pretty cute, actually. So. The texture begs the question, again, does the formation of crystals of the replacement mineral require an open void space? Or is there a mechanism by which crystals of a second species can develop a relatively undistorted habit if the precursor mineral is dissolving simultaneously? Um, there are cases of authogenic minerals not far from this location is uh, the uh, Pecos Valley diamonds which are forming within gypsum. They're crystals that are growing in a solid material so with this idea that we have that void space is required, I don't know that that's true. Um, there is an association at this locality with gypsum. So this is kind of just to show you there's big massive gypsum here. Um, these are in kind of a, a gray green clay layer. And if you're digging in the clay layer, it's very hard to see what's going on. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether these are cast in molds or if something else is happening here. There certainly is the potential since they are in a solid layer that you have a cast mold situation. Something could be holding that form. Um, and then the last time I went out at this location with Jessica and her family, actually we had a great time. Uh, I came home with this guy, which was really exciting. This isn't the first time I've seen it, but this one was particularly distinct in that gypsum is part of the pseudomorph. So we have dolomite and gypsum preserving the form. And uh, if we kind of think back to that slide we had showing all the void space of just the dolomite crystals, I suspect what's happening here is that the gypsum is then infilling that open space and you have two different stages because it looks to me like those dolomite crystals are already pretty well formed and you're just filling in that void space with gypsum later. Now there's another weird thing that happens with the dolomite pseudos that I have not been able to figure out. Um, the locality produces both 
straight edged crystals and these crystals with beveled edges. Uh, the weird thing is it seems to me like all the beveled crystals are inside the straight edged crystals. And I'll show you some more of that, it's very strange. Um, I've had a terrible time trying to photograph this specimen, but you can see you've got beveled edges here. This back edge here is aligned um, and that's a straight edge. So I think we can see it a little bit better with one that's slightly less exposed. We have a straight edge pseudo-hexagonal habit. But what we're looking at is this bottom edge here, which we can start to see something going on. Those are crystal faces. I don't know if you can make out this little area here, but that inside of that straight edge pseudomorph is one of the beveled edge pseudomorphs. So I'm not sure if um, this is something that's a feature of the aragonite and the pseudomorph has just managed to preserve different growth stages within that aragonite crystal. I have a lot of questions about those. I find them very perplexing. So we're gonna go back to coppers real quick. We're gonna stay in New Mexico now. So the copper rose, uh, copper replacing azurite. And now very conveniently, um, the copper rose is in the same geologic region as the Chino mine and a bunch of the neighboring mines. Um, the relative or relevant neighbor being the Hanover, which gives us a perfect analog for what these pseudomorphs would have looked like before replacement. Um, they're suspended in a clay material So it might have occurred to you, based on previous discussion of copper and oxidizing and reducing conditions, uh, this one's backwards. So most things are moving towards oxidation. In this case, we had azurite come back to copper. We're moving the other direction. Um, oxidizing conditions are going to be ultimately more common than reducing conditions. I'm not sure if that's a function of actual probability or just that because we live on the Earth's surface and it's hard to get very deep that we just get to see more of the oxidizing conditions. It's possible the reducing conditions are common, we just can't get to them to study them. Um, but for the most part, reducing is a little bit unusual. So let's see. Um, I, I think for the most part, given the chemical relationship that these probably are alteration pseudomorphs, but again, because they are encased in a solid material, you could have some kind of cast or mold or infiltration because something has preserved that form. Um, so you get uh, the first one, a very nice single crystal. You get nice rosettes. And uh, you can see that'll also go, again, the transition to malachite. Um, hypothetically, again, there should be a stage of cuprite in here. Some of the old reports on this locality does mention cuprite replacements. I've never seen one. And I don't know if it's just that I didn't recognize it as a cuprite pseudomorph. Um, I've asked a couple people in the New Mexico community if they've ever seen cuprite ones and everybody said no. But I have some more people to ask. Not really sure on that one. And of course, one of the greatest treasures of the copper rose is that sometimes you find a noid. Um, and that's a crinoid, of course. You get the really nice little crinoid right there. You can see him blown up over here. And then, of course, you've actually got a little guy right there and a little guy right there. And actually, probably a lot of those little cobbles may be broken sections. I'm not going to make any assumptions because if it's broken, you can't tell. I don't know. But we have enough distinct ones that you can see that. So we could probably talk about copper pseudos for days. We're gonna look at a couple more pieces from Michigan and then move on. Um, this is another pseudomorphic mystery. Copper's replaced something. There's still a lot of debate about whether the precursor mineral was lamantite or albite. Um, the argument for albite includes uh, some twinning happening, which I think should give us a pretty quick answer, but I don't know the twin laws of albite very well, so I don't feel qualified to weigh in on that conversation. Um, there are some relationships that look like they could be twins to me, but I'm gonna let somebody else make that call. Um, and of course you get some weird things like copper replacing quartz. So in this case, you have a replacement of agate. Um, and the textures here are just absolutely fascinating because you can see where the copper is following the bands of the agate. Um, there's at least two sets of conditions that could explain the dissolution of quartz, because obviously quartz is not well known for being soluble. Um, basic conditions will corrode quartz. Another possibility is the addition of fluorine to the system. So in this case, you're not gonna be basic, you're gonna be acidic because you've got hydrofluoric acid. Um, in conversations with Chris Stefano about these, um, he mentioned that 
there isn't much fluorite in the Michigan Copper District, which probably indicates that it's not fluorine. He's probably right about that. The only thing I would point out is that if there um, have been cases where things have been removed and weren't preserved in pseudomorphs, we may be missing pieces of information. So it's maybe there was fluorite that's gone now. Probably not, but we're trying not to make weird assumptions. So, and of course you can get replacements of quartz crystals. Um, these are rare enough that the study of them is incredibly limited. Um, one feature that Chris pointed out to me is that the surfaces of quartz that are not covered by copper are very etched. Um, that may be corrosion by the fluid precipitating the copper, or it could be a later fluid, but the areas that are covered were protected. The areas that are not covered are messed up. <laughs> They've been chewed at. Um, and so since we're already on the topic of quartz, we're just going to finish out with some uh, interesting quartz pseudomorphs. Quartz, of course, is a very common mineral in pseudomorphism, probably just because quartz is very common. So tying into our copper sections, uh, in this case we have another malachite replacement of azurite, but the quartz gives us another layer. So this gives us another sequence of events in geologic time. You have three mineralizations, azurite, malachite, and quartz, a step in between each, which gives you two periods of replacement. Maybe that's what a double pseudomorph is. Um, this is a nice demonstration that a replacement mineral can preserve the precursor but can still take on its own habit. So it is a hollow incrustation. It's fairly thick, which is giving us a rounding of the shape. But when we start to look at the surface textures, we get some really interesting things. This is a texture, I, I've seen these or something like this in some of the um, chalcedony roses from Arizona and New Mexico, where the chalcedony starts to grade into crystalline quartz and you get some very strange hoppered quartz crystals. Um, I'm not sure if there's a relationship, but you do have two chalcedony locations, so possibly. Um, quartz is also great for preserving amazing detail. So in this case, I, forgive me, I'm not a twinning expert, but I'm pretty sure that's a calcite twin that we can now study, even though the calcite is gone. Now the other thing that's a little bit interesting is if you look up in these void spaces, we're starting to get, it's not completely empty. We've got stuff on the inside. And then we end up with a situation, this is all stuff on the inside. Um, this is a really strange specimen and I um, forgot to put it on there. Dan Evanich gave this to me, bless his heart. Um, the Feywood is known for paper thin quartz incrustations after calcite where you have no remaining calcite on the inside. This one is very strange because I don't see that outer incrustation. I just see the interior has been filled. And we get this very incredibly porous structure. Um, you can see kind of up on this top edge, there's actually a missing crystal and you can kind of see the, the granular cross section there. Um, but you can still make out the faces, the habit's really well preserved, but we start to have questions, how did this happen? You know, do we start with an incrustation that just progressed all the way inward? Is this a case of infiltration where quartz is depositing at the same time as calcite and it's just not filling in rapidly enough? Like, why is this so coarse? And then you get something weird like this where it's not coarse at all, it's completely fine. It's, it's all quartz and it's completely solid. Um, the internal cleavage of the calcite has been preserved in this specimen. It's a, you can see, see the structure in there. It's one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Um, I've heard stories about pseudomorphs that even though it's a new mineral, it will actually preserve qualities of the precursor mineral, meaning that quartz would have a, the cleavage of calcite. I'm not sure I believe that's possible, but this, this specimen makes me wonder, I'm not going to break it to find out, <laughs> but I would, be, I would be really curious whether it would break along those cleavages because they're perfectly preserved. Um, and so while we're looking at how this happened, one of the interesting things we see is this sort of lighter, lighter beige area, and it certainly looks like that's a second coating. It's a different layer at the very least. Um, we can see the thickness of it where it's chipped off. But then we look a little bit more and we get down into 
this guy pointed into the cavity, which is really interesting because that grades completely from this darker material to the light material with, with no edge. So is this lighter material, is that actually a separate growth or is that a change in the chemistry as something's depositing? Is that part of one stage of deposition? So the other thing I think that's a little bit interesting about these specimens, they're all perched on top of these really nice quality, good clear quartz crystals. And you can see this little guy right here, you can see a little bit where that beige layer probably covered this and it's been chipped away. I think it's a little bit interesting that you had quartz crystals, you had calcite, you had something happen that turned the, quart the calcite into quartz, but those original quartz crystals don't seem to have been affected at all. Um, and it, not that that's impossible, but I would have expected to see some something happening to those quartz crystals given whatever that process was, but they're fine, There's, they're good. Um, to draw back to aragonite, we can look at a few different quartz replacements of aragonite. Um, Needle Peak to me seems like it's probably in crustaceans, at least in the case of the pseudomorph that I have, there's still stuff inside it. I honestly, I didn't, <laughs> I meant to check to see whether that was aragonite or quartz, and I ran out of time and I didn't do that, but there's still something inside of that. Now when we go over to Argentina and quartz after aragonites, we see signs instead of infilling. Um, so we've got these very, very rough surfaces on the edges of the crystals, which is probably caused by whatever the encasing material is. Um, and then when we get into the textures of what is basically agate, um, I don't think you would end up with those patterns if it wasn't something that was infilling a void space. I think that has to be what's happening here. Now, of course, pseudomorphs' deceivers frequently present mysteries. So we're gonna talk about a couple mysteries and then wrap it up. I think it's fair to say that when we're talking about pseudomorphs, we're dealing with best guesses. Most of these, if there's no original material left, we don't have any way to analyze it. We don't know what it is except that, you know, we see these habits, we can best guesses, chemical relationships, maybe we know a little bit about the geology of the deposit, but a lot of times we should have probably a few more question marks on our labels than we do. Um, this is a really oddball specimen that I don't have any idea what it, it was. The original material is entirely gone. Um, the previous habit is very distinct. Um, most discussions that I've had about it, it's aragonite or cerusite, both of which have their problems. Um, you know, I've seen the internal structure of aragonite do something like this. I can't say that I've ever seen a specimen of macro aragonite take on this form. I've seen cerusite do this, but obviously cerusite's gonna be a much less common mineral, so I don't know that that explains it. Um, Probably need to measure some angles. <laughs> and of course, you guys have your own super special, super special mystery up here with Bessemer Ridge. Um, these have been around for decades. We're still arguing about what they are. Um, most commonly, we see this spongy reddish gray hematite that has replaced something that's been overgrown by small prismatic quartz crystals. And the quartz does take on its own habit, but preserves the unknown mineral underneath it. And then we have this guy from John Lindell, it's turned my entire world inside out. We'll get, we'll figure it out, John, someday. So this example shows that hematite replacement. We've got relatively sharp faces. Uh, and actually I've been, since John gave this to me, I've been looking for a goniometer because I think the faces on this are clear enough that we could measure the angles. If anybody has a lead on where I can get a goniometer, please let me know because all I can find is these crappy plastic things for joints and I need more precision than that. So let me know if you know where to get one, because I need one. Um, I think we could measure the angles on this, and I, it might not be exact, but it'd get us somewhere. And of course, the funny thing is, the quartz is on the inside. This guy's inside out. So I, you know how you end up with most of your specimens, the quartz is on the outside, and this one is on the inside? I, I, don't, I don't have any idea, but the open space on this one is on the inside and not the outside. And guys, it, I've been puzzling for two years, three years now, John. <laughs> so I have more questions than I have answers. Um, and many, many thanks to all of the people who have put up with 
me asking endless questions. I really appreciate it and I probably won't stop. You can always tell me to stop contacting you. I would respect that. Um, but I hope everybody will take a chance to look at the ugly rocks twice because I think they have a lot to tell us. And again, if there's something that I've said today or if you have answers to any of these questions, please, please, please email me. I would love to continue the conversation. I would love to get to the root of a lot of these things. And man, uh, we didn't even look at all the pseudos. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, so that's what I have today. Okay, we can take a couple of questions. Be sure to repeat the question. So many questions. I need somebody with some answers, actually. <laughs> yes, Bill. Potential answer. If you look at the uh, Sumab asteroids, there's a couple of other people see the quite bright, bright shiny green asteroid crystal. Smithsonian has one about that big. Small, but they have these sunburst of the malachite. The malachite okay. is coming out of the sunburst. In the middle, it's a lot like a drop. In the middle of that sunburst is a pit, damage. Interesting. So the okay. Damage to the crystal face the could you know, potentially be the reason the malachite is starting there. You were asking about your rocks. Yeah. yeah. Saying it. It's not dissimilar at all. Look at these, but yeah. the middle of it look, is a pit. Okay. Okay. So yeah, to repeat for the online folks, um, that wasn't so much a question as, as a possible answer. Bill was talking about um, some of the Sumeb malachite after azurites, where you have a, a radiating starburst of malachite, but that there's a point in the middle of those that you're saying you think it's a a little bit of damage a little bit of damage and that it's radiating from that point and that that might have some relationship to the, the droplet textures that we saw. That's very possible. I think I need to look at a lot more malachite after azurite because I think there's quite a bit going on with those. It's a, it's a good thought. Yeah. 